Hey everybody, Neo once again from the Overclocker magazine with the first review of 2021. So happy new year and all that good stuff. Here's to 2021 being a significantly better year for all of us than 2020 was. And even for hardware as well, I suspect it's going to be super awesome, even better than last year. So for the first review of the year, I'm bringing you the ASRock B550 Phantom Gaming ITX slash AC. I'm not going to call it that throughout the duration of this review. That's just too long. This motherboard is definitely my favorite mini ITX board that isn't X570. So what makes this board tick is the typical stuff. So you have the USB type C at the back, right? One type C connector, and then the rest of them are just standard USB 3.X. I'm not sure if it's 3.2 or something like that, but they're all high speed, but there's only six of them. And then you also get the header as well for normal three, uh, USB 3.0 and for USB type C as well. So it's pretty awesome. And then you also get space for two M.2 drives so one at the top with the heat sink and the other one beneath the motherboard hopefully you can see all of that right now but that's the standard stuff you know all of that stuff now what about power so this uses an actual eight phase power design there are no doublers anywhere to be seen and all of these power stages i think are about 90 amps so obviously you can put a lot of current through this not that you would actually be putting 90 amps through each of the phases but it's nice to know that at least in theory you are able to do this but that's not what i'm here to tell you about this is a mini ITX board and what you might expect from a mini ITX board is awesome memory overclocking. I mean, if you look at a lot of the scores that were put up for Ryzen systems, they were actually done on a mini ITX board. Okay, so there's obviously a lot of power and potential in these boards. It's not like before where you were thinking, I'm just losing out on features and things like that. So why does this board rock? Because it OCs memory so well. Now, this is the reason why I gave you that spiel about mini ITX boards prior to this. So I was expecting this board obviously to be able to do an F clock of 1,900 megahertz, okay, 1.9 gigahertz. But since we're dealing with AMD Ryzen 5000 on this platform, I was hoping to be able to do a bit more. So here's the thing before I go into the memory OC and how well this board performs. Right now, at least with the latest BIOS that I have or put on the board, and I think this is across on other boards as well. If you set a very high F clock, and I'm talking sometimes 1900 megahertz, and then obviously at 2000 and maybe 2000 and 2100, you're going to get these Windows hardware errors. Okay, that you get them randomly, but they can be quite substantial. You get like 500 of them in mere, in mere seconds. And that gets worse as you go up in frequency for the F clock, especially if you're doing one-to-one -one with the memory. Yeah, why else wouldn't you do that? So that issue is present on this motherboard. However, I am going to tell you that it's only really an issue if you set an F clock of 2100. At 2000, yes, you still get those errors, but the performance is still good. I didn't experience any DPC latency issues at all. And I actually could tell and measured performance that was actually better. So if you care for that sort of thing and these Windows hardware errors actually bother you, then definitely do not run 2000, just stick to 1.9 gigahertz and lower. However, if you are anything like myself and you don't really care for that because it has no material effect on how you use the computer, then definitely try 2000 megahertz. I wouldn't go 2100 unless if your CPU is super special, but 2000 definitely works. And this is where the memory OC of this motherboard is so damn good. So for just raw frequency, I mean, that's also dependent on the sticks I have. I have really good B die, right? The A data Spetrix. So I have really good B die in that memory. And I was able to do 4,600 mega transactions per second with little to no, in fact, it was no effort. Just set 4,600 in the board post, like literally, you don't have to do anything. The timings are rubbish, but it's able to do that. So you'll just tighten the timings accordingly to get better performance. So 4,600, as nice as that is, that's not really gonna go anywhere. I mean, the QVL goes all the way to 5,400. So 4,600 is not gonna be amazing. But the thing is 4,200 is actually usable or rather 4,000. Yeah, let's say 4,000, even 4,133. Yeah, but 4,000 for the most part is actually quite usable because that means you can run 2,000 F clock and you can run 2,000 megahertz on the memory, which translates into DDR4, 4,000. And at that frequency with some really tight timings, you're gonna get super, super performance. And this is what I was able to do on this motherboard with so much ease. I really didn't have to do much. 
And this is part of the reason why I like this board. It's just so easy to overclock and it's very predictable. So usually for AMD, for AMD motherboards, I've found that recovering from a failed OC can get quite difficult. And sometimes the board will just refuse to recover and you have to remove the battery and things like that. But that's not the case with this motherboard. At least I haven't experienced that yet. Now, I don't have a postcode LED on this and I have no other way of knowing what the board is doing when it's posting. But even with that said, I don't need that because the board is so reliable. Once you dial in your settings and you save them, the board will post time and time again, regardless. Now, the one thing that is true about this motherboard is that I cannot tighten some timings as tightly as I could on the Aorus motherboard. Now, this is the difference between setting two ticks and one tick, okay? So on the ASRock motherboard, some settings, as you can see, hopefully, you cannot set these to one, whereas you can on the Aorus board. And that board is particularly efficient at memory uh, overclocking or memory performance. So if you go 3,800 megatransactions per second with an one-to-one F-clock on this ASRock motherboard, and you do the same on the Aorus board, you will actually find that the Aorus board gives better performance when everything is dialed in. So I'm talking secondary timings, tertiary timings, and all of that stuff. Now, the reason this happens is because of those tighter or rather lower ticks that you can set on the Aorus board, whereas there you're limited to setting one, here you're limited to setting two. But on the Aorus board, it will not go higher than 1900 megahertz on the F-clock one-to-one, whereas with the same CPU, on the Phantom board, you actually can do that. And that's where the Phantom difference or advantage is. I can run 2000 all day on this board. I can't on the other board. At least that was the situation given the latest BIOS updates I had for both motherboards. That's the difference. And this is what gave this motherboard the edge for me because I can go high on the memory on this, like really, really, really high, much higher than I could on the Aorus board. And like I said, this is really matters to me because that's where I derive some added performance that I otherwise would not have, especially with the CPU that I'm using. I'm using a Ryzen 7 5800X that isn't particularly great at overclocking. I think it will do all core 4.6 gigahertz, which is not right, 4.6. But anyway, since I'm limited by that, I have to make the most of what I can just using the F clock and the memory clock and that's where I was going to need this motherboard instead of any other board that just couldn't do as high an F clock. I have to talk about the BIOS or the UEFI on the ASRock boards. It's so quick. It's so quick. It's so easy to use to navigate and all of that stuff. So you'll find that on the Aorus board, the B550, and even on the ROG board, that the space that you have for putting in the characters for your profile is not actually how much space you have in characters to, to put in. So you start typing and then, oh, okay, it just ends there. And then you have this extra space on the side. What is that for? Okay, that, that, what is that for? But on this motherboard, you can actually describe the settings that you are saving and save them accordingly instead of having to use codes and things like that. Now, again, this board is awesome in that capacity and in that way. However, it wasn't a perfect experience. This is particular to this sample. Okay, so if you go out and buy this board, you will not have this issue. You will notice that my temperatures were actually stuck at a ridiculous number, like minus one degrees or 6,533. I don't know what was going on there, but the actual temperature reading in Windows utilities and everything else that you might need reads correctly. So you don't have to worry about this. And again, this was particular to the sample. It has nothing to do with the rest of them. For $200, or however this may cost here, I don't think you're gonna do much better than this. In fact, I don't think you'll do better than this, period. Because you can go to the other vendors, they're gonna offer you similar solutions in terms of features and functions, but if you consider something like the power delivery, some of them are only four-phase solutions with doublers, okay? So you're not going to get the exact combination of parts that you're going to get, or other features and components that you get on the B550 Phantom Gaming ITX. And as a result, it becomes probably, no, it becomes my favorite ITX board for now. So if you check out, I think HKEPC's review of this very same motherboard, you'll see they did the memory frequency of 5100 or 5400 or something like that, but a really high frequency. So true to what 
as Rock actually claims on the website, you can actually do 5400. It's not really a frequency I care about, but it's nice to know that it is possible to do such things. So I didn't get an opportunity to try dry ice on this motherboard. I probably will sometime soon and I'll bring you that video. But for now, if you are like me and you are interested in a high performance mini ITX motherboard with all the bells and whistles that you actually need, like the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the USB 3.2, the headers and M.2, two of them even, one underneath the board and one at the top. This is the board for you, definitely. I don't think there's a more practical mini ITX board for the AMD chipset that you can buy right now. Short of the crosshair board, this is the one I would go to. And as such, this is near perfect score for me if I was scoring the motherboard. But anyway, let me know what you think about the motherboard below. Remember to share, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the flip side. I hope you have fun, peace, and take care.